It's a privilege to be at Miranda House. I never had the privilege of studying here because I studied a subject that you don't talk about. But I would have loved to be a part of your community if I had the chance. Uh, today's topic is Through the Looking Glass. Um, through the Looking Glass has many meanings for me. Um, I you know, want to talk about um, this is a little clip on, uh, from the film and I just want to use that as a basis. Okay, so this was Alice going through the looking glass. Um, and the theme is of particular relevance to me because uh, of many reasons. The first being that through my life, I've had windows of opportunity open up for me. And when I've stepped through those windows, it's been pretty much the same as when Alice stepped through the looking glass. My world changed completely, turned upside down. I entered a new universe. It also has particular relevance to me because I was fortunate um, in that I studied at Christchurch and um, this is in Oxford and the daughter of the Dean, Alice, is the person, the maths professor, Lewis Carroll, used as the inspiration for Alice in Wonderland. So the original manuscripts are in Christchurch and it was always fascinating to live for five years in the place that Alice lived. When I was little, I was fortunate because I had the opportunity to be in the outdoors a lot and I loved reading. I lived, uh, read a lot of books um, and amongst my favorite heroes was Jane Goodall. And I wanted to be like Jane and live in a forest and study animals. Today, I've done so much more, stuff that I have ever imagined I do. I'm a conservation ecologist, a photographer, a public speaker, a diver, underwater photographer, a philanthropist, a design consultant and a an hotelier. And today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my life and all of the looking glasses that I found and stepped through. They call me her daringness, the tiger princess of India. It was in the early 1990s that I came across the first looking glass. Next. In 1992, terrorists attacked our house in Kashmir. They burnt the house down using incendiary bombs, but not before they had used guns to murder seven people who worked for us. This was on the eve of Diwali. We were fortunate that we had come to Delhi and we saw this on national news on the, uh, the Doordarshan. That destroyed the world as I knew it. Everything collapsed around me. I could no longer think of going back and doing my research in Kashmir on snow leopards. It was then that I found the first Water. looking glass. I had a meeting with the director of the Wildlife Institute of India and he offered me the chance to take up a challenge to study tigers. At the age of 22, I borrowed a car from a friend of mine and set off across India to study tigers in central India in Badakar National Park. Next. I lived with the tigers for five years, nine to ten months of the year. Through rain and hail and extreme weather conditions, temperatures would go from minus to about 47, one location even 50 degrees. I, I learned to make these tigers my family. It was no easy task. I had to deal with the whole stigma of being 
one of the first few women biologists working in conservation. There was always this thing about conservationists and wildlifers are, are men. I had people walk up to me and ask for the man who's studying tigers and they wouldn't believe it when I said it was me. It was a tough few years. I went through a lot of opposition um, and then eventually next um, started to prove my mettle and to prove that I could actually do work with the best of them. I um, designed camera traps with the help of IIT Delhi, the first in, that we used for this sort of thing in India. And uh, these are some of the images from then um, and I proved to the world that you didn't need to actually tranquilize and radio collar tigers to study them, that you could do this um, without actually invading their privacy and their space. Next. Four or five years of work, I ultimately presented a thesis at um, the University of Oxford and I got my doctorate, which was one of the finest moments of my life. Post my doctorate, I started to understand that it was not going to be easy to work in the field of conservation. There were many people, many scientists working on tiger conservation who actively opposed everything I did and went out of their way to pull me down. This combined with the fact that I was beginning to realize that I didn't really have the luxury of time to just do research on tigers made me come to my next looking class. Next. Human-wildlife conflict erupted all around me. And this made me realize that living on the edge had a totally different meaning when you work in wildlife conservation. Next. Animals are injured, animals are orphaned. There were cubs and babies that didn't have homes that needed looking after. And at the same time, poachers attacked all the time. Next. Sorry, go back. Yeah. Standing by the pyre of a burning tiger, I took the decision that I would no longer work in academia. That I needed to ensure the survival of the tiger to justify that I was going to spend years on research when they would actually just be wiped out all around me. That opened a different space for me to move from academia into hands-on conservation in the field. I also got married and moved to Nepal. I started working next with different international organizations like the IUCN, like the World Bank, GEF, UNDP, UNEP, ACMOD and started doing projects that made an immediate difference on the field. The years in Nepal weren't easy. The first time I went there, the room sort of parted and I was left standing alone. I was dealing with the stigma of again being a woman in conservation, being an Indian in Nepal, being from the privileged class rather than the common man, and it all led people to believe that I was where I was, not because I was capable, but because of connections. And that's a huge stigma to overcome. I had to prove myself and prove that I, I was there because I deserved to be there, not because I was who I was. Next. After a few years of marriage, things became tough for us on a personal level and to sandwich my marriage we decided that we would try and do some work in India. We chose to come back to central India and I created my first tourism conservation project Singhinava Jungle Lodge. Singhinava was a project that used 54 acres of degraded barren land where trees had been destroyed and Weeds had invaded and taken over. 
into one of the finest lodges at that time. The lodge also made, made it possible for me to have a base to do my conservation work and work with the communities that lived around Prana National Park. Next. The Baiga and Gorn tribal communities abound in that area. I started to work with these people, um, documenting their culture, their art, their knowledge about medicinal plants, their knowledge about the forests of the region. Next. I participated and recorded all their ceremonies. Next. Their dances. I worked to introduce people to the communities that were the true guardians of the magical place called Kana Tiger Reserve. I worked with children, uh, worked with the local potters, with weavers, encouraging them in their art, helping them find a sustainable source of livelihood, which also used tourism to uh, exist in that area. Next. We, we worked on health. Um, we worked next. We worked on creating alternate sources of energy. This was a project I did with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, and we created these bricks from a weed called Lantana, which was taking over the National Park. So it solved two problems in one go. Next, we worked with schools. Next, and we documented things like the use of um, indigenous plants in local cuisine, plants that we would normally not consider as a part of our diet. Next, I actively promoted the use of art for spreading the message about conservation. Uh, towards this end, we organized um, it camps and events, art camps where we had people from different countries come in and interact with the local gold artists and the local artists from the region. Um, at one point, I had people from 16 countries come in and they lived and worked at Sikhinawa talking about what they were doing and um, through their art representing what they were seeing in the Kana Tiger Reserve. Next. Um, this is the artists also worked with the local schools. This is an image of a very famous wildlife artist, a sculptor called Mark Karel. Next. I worked with the park very closely. I continued my alliances with the forest department um, and we continued conservation work within the core reserve of the park. We donated vehicles for the park to use for patrolling. Next. We created water holes in areas where water was scarce, creating new habitat for tigers. Next. We also actively helped in monitoring local wildlife populations. So the continuation of using science with uh, tourism practices, with hospitality, with community work continued. And this was a very, very special world that I had created by taking that window of opportunity um, and trying to do something new. Next. Next. Okay. So then we come to the fourth looking glass. In 2012, um, unfortunately, the marriage had disintegrated <coughs> to the point where my husband asked me not to return to Nepal. He kept everything I owned. I was suddenly standing at this junction and you know they say it, it doesn't rain, it pours. My father got cancer. We had to sell our family house uh, because of a, a problem with other family members. So suddenly in 2014 I had no lodge, no house, no possessions because they were all in Nepal and I was standing at this strange place. It, was, it would have been easy to give up and it was then that I found my fourth looking glass. Another window of opportunity opened up. I sold the lodge, my shares in the lodge and I moved to the world of travel. 
During the years of marriage, I had been prevented from um, using and uh, doing any photography. Because of travel, I started to do a lot of photography. Please could you change the slides? Thank you. That's a slide on travel. Next. This is how I began to spend my time. Next. I learned how to dive and do underwater photography. Next. My work as a wildlife photographer allows me to communicate about conservation issues to the world. Next. Quickly, these are some of the images that I have made. I made a book called Hidden India, which totally changed the rest of the way I would work for the next years. Hidden India was dedicated to my cousin who got killed in a hit and run accident in Goa. Next, we created a place called the Safari Bar at the Lodi Hotel in Delhi. This introduced me to the world of design. This was a complete new world for me, a change. Next. I also went to Ethiopia and did some three years of work on tribal communities in Ethiopia, which resulted in the largest body of work um, as a fine art photographer. Next. Then COVID hit. And that became my fifth looking glass. Next. I created a company called Hidden India. Next. Hidden India was used as an opportunity to actually show the world what I had been doing all of these years. I work on ESG, on being carbon negative in your life. Next. On rewilding, on combating climate change. Next and using biodiversity in architecture to make a statement about sustainable living. Next, I created a property called Hidden India, which took 16 years of rewilding to create. Next, Mahavan is the first carbon negative property in India. It's also the first beyond green property in India. Um, and it's actually the second only in Asia. It's in the world's top 50 sustainable hotels in the world. It's to show people how to do things in tourism. Please continue. Show next slide. These are images of Mahavan. Next. And then I got this opportunity to work with some of the greatest names in a movie on India. And I was so proud to be able to represent India and do this film. It's a one hour film on discovery. Next. I do a lot of talks, a lot of public speaking about my work and work with lots of brands on talking about conservation and sustainability. Next. So what I want to say to you is look for the looking glass in your life. It may not be what you're looking for, it may not be the most apparent thing. It may not be something that you thought would be obvious and in front of you. Even Alice didn't know about the looking glass in her first book, Alice in Wonderland. She discovered it late. So don't be afraid. Keep a lookout. Grasp every opportunity as a door opens, as a window of opportunity opens. Do take it. Be brave. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid that your life is going to turn on its head. It's when your life turns on your head that you go. You grow as a person. You experience new things. You learn what your capabilities are when you face new challenges. So go out there, find your looking glass and step through it. Thank you.